Today we're going to talk about age-structured populations. What do we mean by age-structured populations? Well, we mean that the per capita death rate and the per capita birth rate are not necessarily um, constant throughout the lifespan of the species that we're working with. And this can be painfully obvious when we start considering species like this Indian elephant here. This species has a long lifespan. It is non-reproductive for the first several years of its life and it starts giving birth after it reaches sexual maturity and can give birth repeatedly. It's iteroparous and uh, until it reaches an old enough age where it can no longer give birth. So the birth rate, the per capita birth rate, depends on the age of the individual you're talking about. If you're talking about a two-year-old Indian elephant, then the birth rate's zero. But if you're talking about a 20-year-old Indian elephant, then the birth rate is probably something higher than that. Um, I'm not an expert in Indian elephants, but we can put together an idea of how the the fecundity schedule, that is how birth rate or per capita birth rate changes with age, we can kind of uh, put a conceptual model together that looks something like this, where individuals below the age of sexual maturity don't get, have any reproductive um, rate at all. They're not contributing offspring to the next generation. But once they start to reach sexual, mat sexual maturity, they might ramp up their uh, birth uh, rate until it gets to some maximum rate, or this is kind of the adult um, uh, average per capita birth rate. And then maybe when they reach old age, the birth rate starts to slow down again. So that's, again, this isn't actual numbers. This is just a schematic illustrating a conceptual idea of, of how, how per capita birth rate might change with age for a species like this Indian elephant, all right? So again, age-structured populations, we're talking about how these per capita vital rates, per capita death rate, and per capita birth rate, which previously we had modeled as constants, right, in our insight maker models, our exponential growth models, and our uh, logistic uh, density-dependent population models, this is where we add some additional complexity and we start considering how these, these vital rates, we call them vital rates in population ecology, population vital rates, per capita death rate, per capita birth rate. We're now considering how these depend on density. Uh, sorry, how these depend on age. All right, so we talked about the the fecundity schedule for Indian elephant. What about survival? And let's think about another species where it's painfully obvious that we need to consider age structure when we consider species like a giant tortoise. So let's think about this giant tortoise and think about survival. So b before we go directly to uh, my kind of schematic diagram of how survival might change with age for this species. Just kind of think it through for yourself and see what you come up with. What would survival look like over time for a species like this tortoise? And it's useful to think about other species too. Maybe there's another species that you might be considering for your final project in this class. Maybe you can think through how survival would change with age for that species. In the meantime, let's look at, this is kind of my conceptual diagram of how death rate might change with age, which obviously one minus this is survival. So you can kind of think of death rate, per capita death rate and per capita survival rate as um, just two sides of the same coin. Um, and so here we have this per capita death rate on the y-axis, we might think that the tortoise, when they're very young, they might have a lot of predators out there. Um, they're very small, their shells aren't very strong, and so they might be susceptible to predation by all sorts of birds and other animals. And so 
we might have a high death rate to start off with. And as the shell hardens, as the animal, as the tortoise gets bigger, then we might see a lower per capita death rate until adulthood, at which time the per capita death rate is almost nothing because these tortoises cannot be touched by any predator except for humans, potentially. But they have no natural predators and very, very low mortality rate, very high ability to survive droughts and other types of environmental um, you know, events that might, that might harm other species. These are highly resilient and they're gonna survive and survive and survive until they reach very, very old age, at which point the death rate might increase again. So that's just one example, thinking about this kind of extreme example of a species with age-structured survival or mortality rates. But I encourage you to think through um, for some species that you are interested in, interest, interested in modeling and interested in managing populations for how does their uh, death rate and birth rate change over time? And how is that relevant to the conservation and management of that species. Speaking of relevance to management, let's think about this species for a second. This is a spadefoot toad. Uh, spadefoot toads are declining through parts of their range and it's uh, one method for conserving uh, populations of spadefoot toads is actually to augment populations or to re introduce populations of spadefoot toads to areas that they have become extirpated. So it's a reintroduction of spadefoot toads and we can think a little bit about the life history of a spadefoot toad. We don't have to know too much, but just know that it takes about three years for them to reach sexual maturity. When they are reproductive, they only reproduce after a big rainstorm. When there are ephemeral basically puddles in the ground where the, to the, uh, <laughs> the spadefoot toads can lay eggs and these puddles won't last very long. So the, the tadpole stage of this toad is very, very uh, quick. And so they manage to, to go from tadpole to toadlet in a very, very short amount of time. And once they are toadlets, Ideally, before the little puddle has dried out and they've, uh, they've managed to metamorphose, they, um, they take a few years before they become reproductive and then they repeat the cycle again. After a big rainstorm, they'll all congregate in these, these ephemeral wetlands. Okay, so th this is the scenario that we're thinking of. Why does age structure matter? Well, one thing is just let's do a thought experiment and let's imagine we're trying to re-establish a population of spadefoot toads. We take 1,000 tadpoles from a captive population and we place them in a temporary wetland right after a rainstorm. So we're trying to jumpstart a new population of spadefoot toads by putting tadpoles in a um, in a ephemeral wetland. Um, what would we expect population to growth to look like over the next few years, assuming the reintroduction strategy was successful. All right, so that's, and I'd like you to comment on Top Hat. So take a moment to go to Top Hat and, and answer this question. And again, you're not graded on correctness. Just uh, do your best and try to figure out what this population would look like over time if the reintroduction strategy was successful. Would you see a constant exponential increase in the population over time, or would it look like something else? So take uh, take a minute, take a few minutes to think through this problem and to uh, write an answer in the space provided. Just as an aside, we've been talking about age structured populations, that's when the per capita vital rates change throughout the course of the life history of a species. What about sex structure? Two questions for you to think about. One, can you think of some real world examples where the vital rates might differ between males 
and females. So think of some species that you are interested in and think about the survival rate or the obviously fecundity. <laughs> it's going to be quite different between males and females. Um, females being the only ones who can actually produce offspring into the next generation. But think about survival. Um, how how does survival maybe differ between males and females for a species that you're interested in? All right. And the second question to think about is, is sex structure important to consider when modeling populations? Why or why not? And I already kind of gave the answer away when I said that females are the only ones that are able to contribute offspring to the next generation. That is an obvious point, but at the same time, it shows us why females are uh, the real drivers of population dynamics. So like I mentioned in lab, population models are generally female only. If you look at published population models, you will find that many of them are, they basically ignore males entirely. So these are female only population models. And we can think of most of the models that we've run so far in this class as female only models as well, including the life history, uh, the, the life tables that we uh, worked through in lab three. And uh, throughout most of the class, we can basically think of our models mostly as female only. It just makes it easier uh, to ignore the males. So the reason we have a whole lecture devoted to age-structured populations and we have only one brief aside devoted to sex-structured populations, um, yes, vital rates can differ between the two sexes. Yes, males can have lower or higher survival rate than females. Yes, me <laughs> females produce offspring, males um, contribute to the production of offspring, but they don't produce offspring. And furthermore, most populations are not monogamous. And that is the key to why males are not really important in population models. Because if there's just a few males in a population, most females will be fertilized. Most females will be able to, to give birth. So males don't really limit the number of offspring produced. As long as there's a few males in the population, all the females should be able to re reproduce at their maximum capacity. So although there may be differences in vital rates by sex, it's not really important because really only the females are driving population dynamics in most cases. All right. Next thought experiment. Let's think about this golden-headed lion tamarin for a moment. And we imagine we have, we're studying a population of 100 golden-headed lion tamarins that consists all of adult males and post-reproductive females. Now, what's the conservation status of this population? So if you read the question carefully, it should be fairly obvious. You have a population that consists of 100 animals, but we have males in this population. Great. <laughs> but we also have only post-reproductive females. That is, the, the females in the population are too old to produce offspring. And so what's the overall fecundity or overall birth rate in this population, it is basically zero. Because even though there are males in the population, there's no reproductive females. And females, and reproductive females in particular, are the ones that drive population dynamics. Therefore, the conservation status of, status of this population is effectively extinct. Even though there's still animals there, this, is, this population is doomed to extinction. All right, so that is another reason why we really have to think about aid structure when we think about conservation and management of wild populations. We have to know the aid structure and the, the fecundity schedule because if the animals, if the females in the population are too old to reproduce, that is obviously not a good sign for the population. So that's why we 
think about age structure when we uh, model uh, wild populations and how these populations work. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about how we look at the the uh, uh, you know how fecundity and how survival rate and mortality rate change with age for species. Now, the the first way we generally look at um, age structure in populations is through using life tables, and that's what Lab 3 is largely devoted to. So we're going to um, go quickly through this because this, is, this concept is also introduced in Lab 3. But this is a standard life table. Remember that X represents the age of the individuals in a cohort. We're talking about a cohort here. So a cohort is a group of organisms of the same species that are born during the same year. So the cohort starts off, we have uh, 500 individuals in the cohort. They're all just newly born. Generally, B sub X, B, that's the per capita birth rate. That'll be zero for newborns, usually. And L of X represents survivorship, which uh, we'll talk about in a second, and G of X represents survival rate. So what we're doing in a life table is just monitoring a cohort over time and recording the total number that remain um, at, uh, after year one. Basically, this is the number that made it from birth to year one. This is the number that made it from birth to year two. The number that made it from birth to year three and then um, in general a life table has to end with zero basically um, to track a whole cohort uh, from the time of birth until the last member of the cohort is no longer alive. Now we not only track who is still alive but we also track how many offspring are produced by um, the cohort at various uh, times throughout their life span. And so we can see that in this case, uh, one-year-olds tended to produce two offspring per female, two-year-olds tended to produce three offspring per female, three-year-olds produced one offspring per female, and then four-year-olds had zero. Um, there really weren't any four-year-olds. <laughs> um, that was the maximum age. And so um, let's talk about the fecundity schedule. Now the fecundity schedule just represents how this per capita birth rate changes throughout the course of the life history of a species. Now, that's only half the story. That's a really easy one to represent. That's just like what we saw up here with the Indian elephant example, just how the per capita birth rate changes over time. Now, we can think about how survival rate changes over time, and we can represent it through something like this. But the way survivor, uh, survival rate is actually represented, um, or more typically represented, is through something called a survivorship curve. And so let's talk a little bit about survivorship. First of all, let's define survivorship. So remember that the term cohort just represents a bunch of individuals that were all born at the same time. Um, the, in the life table, this represents the survival, or the total number of survivors, and this represents the percent of the cohort that, um, so this is called survivorship, L sub X. Survivorship represents the percent or the fraction of the cohort that remains after, that, that makes it to a given age, basically. So by definition, 100% or 1.0 fraction of the uh, cohort makes it to age zero because they had to exist at, at some point. So here we see that 0.8 or 80% of the cohort makes it to age one, 40% of the cohort makes it to age two, 10% of the cohort makes it to age three, and 0% make it to age four. Um, so that's survivorship. Survival rate, G sub X, is just the survival rate uh, from the current age to the next age. So the survivorship or the survival rate for age zero individuals is the probability of making it from age zero to age one, that's 80%. And the survival rate from age one to age two is 
The survival rate from age two to age three is 25 percent, and we can actually there's an easy link between survival rate and survivorship, where to calculate the survivorship, all you have to do is multiply the survivor the survival uh, rates together. So, for instance, to make it to age two, you had to survive from age zero to one, and you had to survive from age one to two, right? So you multiply 0 0.8 times 0 0.5, and that gives you 0.4, all right? And then you multiply 0 0.4 by 0.25, and that gives you 0.1. So that is how survival rate and survivorship are linked. They are very, they're different concepts, but they're obviously highly related. Now, this brings us to a discussion of survivorship curves. So we can represent how survival changes over time um, and how the survival rate changes over time, the survivorship schedule of a species. We can represent using a survivorship curve. First of all, let's, let's discuss th the three main types of survivorship curves. Their cl survivorship curves are classified as type 1, type 2, and type 3. Survivorship curves, first of all, describe how the, log the logarithm of survivorship drops off with age. All right, and I'll explain why in just a second. These three types of life history patterns, type 1, type 2, type 3, um, can be illustrated with these wor real world examples. So uh, typically we think of type one survivorship curves as representing something like humans. We have kind of a type one survivorship curve and type two survivorship curve, we can think of something like a songbird. It's a classic example of a type two survivorship curve. In a type three survivorship curve, we can think of this frog. All right. And so what do we mean by type one? Well, it's best to kind of look at a graph and, and we can then say, okay, here's these three types of, of very distinct survivorship curve. Humans tend to have high survival until old age when survival rate drops off. All right. Songbirds typically have fairly constant survival rate throughout their entire lifetime, lifespan. All right. So that's type two. And type three tend to have very high mortality at first. So the survivorship really drops off early in the life history. And then the adults in the species have a higher survival rate and can persist for longer periods of time. But the majority of those individuals that are born don't make it to adulthood. That's type three. So type one, High survivorship until old age when it drops off. Type two is constant survivor survival rate through time, through time, and type three is very high mortality at first, and then higher survival as you age. All right. Now take a moment to think about this question in Top Hat. Again, there's no points for correctness. Just uh, see, just. Take a minute to think about it and answer the question, but which survivorship curve, which of these three types of survivorship curves is most common in nature? Before we move on to the exercises in Excel and Insight Maker, I just wanted to um, illustrate why we use the log transformation when we do survivorship curves. The way I like to think about this is to look at what the survivorship curve would look like if we didn't log transform. And we're, let's just think about the type two. This is the type two survivorship curve. And this is constant per capita death rate or survival rate through the entire life lifetime. All right. So that's the type two. What is type two going to look like if we just plotted this with a non, no log transformation at all? This is just, um, let's say L for survivorship. And we'll start off at 100% at 
This is kind of aid your time. And we'll start off at birth. That is x. x is the age. If we want to think about life table terminology, x is 0. We have 100% survivorship. And now we start to move through time. And again, we have constant survival rate. So what is it going to look like? And let's put a number on it. So we have D equals 0 0.7. So it's 70% mortality every year. All right. So what are we going to have at year one? Well, we're going to have around 30 individuals remaining that are one year old in the cohort, right? And then we'll have 30% of that remaining at year two. So we have something like that. And then we have something like that, 30% of the remaining individuals, something like that. So what is it going to look like? Type 2 survivorship curve is going to look like this, which if you go back here, it's gonna, you're, you're going to think, oh, this is a type 3 survivorship curve. No, it is a type 2 survivorship curve because we forgot to log transform the axis. So to compute the survivorship for age 1, or x equals 1, we take 1, which is the initial survivorship, and we multiply it by the survival rate from 0 to 1. That is the probability of surviving from 0 to 1, which is 0 0.3 in this case. And if we wanted to get the survivorship to age 2, we take 1 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.3. And if we wanted to get the survivorship at any time x, we could take 1 times, and this here, 0 0.3, basically represents g of x. That's the survival rate. So we take the survival rate, and we take it to the power of x, all right? And so that basically describes how we can model survivorship as a function of, of this survival rate, this constant survival rate. And we get, if we don't log transform, we get something that looks like this. This is exponential decline. The, the cohort will decline exponentially over, over time. Um, and you'll get something that looks like that. So what if we log transform this? So let's now take the log of the survivorship is equal to the log of the constant survival rate to the x power, right? Now we can simplify this. So that equal sign is the same as here. And we can simplify it by just saying um, we can move this, this x outside. So now we have x times log of the survival rate. And what is this? Well, this is a constant here. And this is our, our x-axis. So basically, what we have here is a slope times x. So the log of survivorship will be a linear relationship with age. So if you look at the log survivorship, we're going to start off at 0 and It'll be this linear decline with age. And that represents constant, constant survival, survival rate throughout the life history of this species. And that is a linear relationship. And that's the type 2 uh, survivorship curve. So in order to differentiate nicely between the type two and the type three survivorship curves, we need to log transform because that makes sure that the type two survivorship curve is linear. Otherwise, if we don't log transform, 
both type 2 and type 3 will look like this exponential decay, and it's going to be hard to tell the difference between a type 2 and a type 3 survivorship curve. So oftentimes you'll see, um, in fact, I can just show this. This is actually a log transformed axis. It doesn't necessarily look like that in, at first glance, but what you see here is that you have 100% of the cohort that uh, remains after time zero, which makes sense. And then look at where you would normally think of like 50 being, this is like, this is now 10. So this is a base, a log base 10 transformed axis. So you have one that's 10 to the zeroth power, 10 to the oneth power, and 10 to the second power. And so each with each um, axis tick here, you can see that it increments by 10, uh, it increments by, by an order of magnitude, right? So 1, 10, 100, instead of 1, 2, 3, or 1, you know, 50, 100. It's incrementing by orders of magnitude. So if you see an axis that looks like that, that's a log transformed axis. And so it's really the same thing as what we just did in the whiteboard, where we log transformed the, the y axis or log transformed survivorship. So um, that's just a brief demo on why we use the log transformation here. In the next video, we are we will go through um, briefly the the in class or the the demos that we're going to go over in class, um, and so I will see you there.